So good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for part two of our Dementia Care webinar series for October. We're excited to have Melanie back again. Last time we talked about bathing, and this time we're going to talk about eating, one of my favorite subjects. Um, <laughs> um, we are going to... Um, mute everyone once we start and then Melanie will unmute herself. We ask that you stay muted because there will be a lot of us on the call this morning. Um, if you're not familiar with Dementia Alliance or me, I'm Lisa Levine. I'm the Director of Education and Dementia Alliance is a nonprofit that helps families and people living with dementia across the state of North Carolina. We believe that everybody impacted by dementia deserves excellent quality of life and that's one of the reasons that we are here with our friend um, Melanie Bunn today to help you all learn about giving um, excellent care to our loved ones. We would like to thank Kent Thompson and Capital Financial Solutions for being our primary sponsor of this. And we thank all of you for joining us. Um, for more education and resources and to learn about when we'll be doing the next series, please uh, check out our website, DementiaNC.org. And we also have a YouTube channel. You go to YouTube and just search Dementia Alliance of North Carolina. You will find many more Melanie videos. That's hard to say, but easy to watch. So you will find a lot of <laughs> Melanie videos there. So, um, and uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Melanie, she's um, a nurse, a nurse educator, a mom, a friend, a wonderful person. She conducts over 200 educational sessions um, every year, probably more this year, I would imagine, Melanie. And um, she works with families, first responders, universities, community groups, all of us, you name it. And she's also led a support group for over 25 years. And she's one of my favorite go-tos for all questions and answers dementia. So um, Melanie, I am just gonna let you take it away today. Let me make sure I've muted everyone. And Melanie, if you'd um, unmute yourself. All right, thanks, Lisa. You're welcome. Well, um, I am so excited to be with you for this hour. Um, I could easily spend, oh, three, 10, 100 hours um, talking about this topic in all different kinds of ways, but this is gonna be enough to kind of get us started. I'm gonna hopefully leave some times at the end for um, questions and, and individual kinds of things, but um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm so excited to see some familiar names um, and really excited to, to see some names I don't recognize because this community of people who, who've been around for a while can be really great support to the community who are just getting started and we can all learn from each other. So, so thank you for being here. I'm gonna um, share my screen and um, you know I don't get paid if I don't do at least a little bit of a PowerPoint. Um, it's just kind of the way life goes these days. But um, I am gonna show you a little, um, a, some slides and then we're going to actually do some talking together again thanks to dementia alliance for sponsoring this this slide looks familiar for those of you who maybe were here last week um, talking about the person the approaches and the environment and that's what we're kind of going to build on for this session are things about the person we can know things about our approaches that we can change and things about the environment that can really make a difference so I'm going to use a model. Um, a colleague, Tipa Snow, who's been a really good friend to Dementia Alliance when it was Alzheimer's North Carolina, when it was um, affiliated with the Alzheimer's Association, a long-term colleague and friend. We're working on the idea that the, the models of managing change in people living with dementia were pretty dreary and not very helpful. Tifa is an occupational therapist, I'm a nurse. We're really less interested in what people can't do than in what people can do. Because if something's gone, it doesn't help me. If I know what's left, then that can really give me something to work with. So we were working with different models and Tifa had the brilliant idea 
um, to take a model by an occupational therapist named Claudia Allen and do some work with it and then reframe it as gems. So the idea that we're really celebrating the preserved abilities of people living with dementia. So that's kind of what we're gonna to use to frame thinking about changes in eating and changes in nutrition. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna give you um, a brief kind of, a few words to describe each of these gems and then kind of dig in a little bit to how that impacts eating and nutrition and what kinds of things we can do. So let's start with the diamonds. So if you think about opening up your box for your birthday and you get a diamond, are you happy? So y'all can share with me. Y'all can show me thumbs up. You can show me um, some of the little, um, yay, thumbs up. He's excited about a diamond. Um, you can show me the little, um, emotions that you can post. You can show me some of those. And if you get a diamond, you're excited because diamonds are beautiful and they're shiny and they're expensive and they have so much to offer. But diamonds are also really hard and inflexible. And that's the part that gets to be a challenge when we're thinking about eating and nutrition for people in this diamond state. So these are people who, if you just meet them casually, you might not even realize that there's anything wrong with them. If you just have a conversation, they might seem to be fine, but when you spend time with them, you start to notice them saying the th same things over and over again. You notice them having some trouble getting their words out choosing the right words, you'll notice they're having some, some differences in how they organize themselves and, and how they control their impulses. So those are the kinds of things we're talking about. So specifics of nutrition and eating for people living with dementia at this stage, we start to think about those changes. It's everything from the thinking about it to the doing it. So what tends to happen for people in this state is they, they struggle with those different pieces. So I'm gonna actually stop sharing for a minute and we're just kind of gonna talk about this. So the memory part, so if you put your fingers right here, the memory part, what happens early on with dementia, particularly Alzheimer's type dementia, is they have trouble getting new stuff in, but they remember all of the old stuff. So I am going to call, um, I'm gonna ask my friend Mary Donnelly um, to unmute for just a minute. Mary, would you mind playing with me? Sure. So you can unmute and show your screen. I'm so afraid that I will do that, but it's, um, yeah. <laughs> Good morning, Melanie. Hey, Mary Donnelly. I hadn't planned on anybody seeing me this morning, oh well. <laughs> well, you know, that's the, that's the problem with being a friend. You're fine. Um, so, Mary, so you are my daughter, and I am your mom, and you call me this morning just to check on me because I haven't been eating very well. Mm -hmm. okay. So just kind of ask me about what I've been eating and things like that. Good morning, Mom. How are you doing this morning? Hey, sweetheart. I'm doing great. How are you? I'm just doing fine. Just doing fine. Um, so, uh, what'd you have for breakfast this morning, mom? Well, I had a peanut butter bagel. A peanut butter bagel? That sounds pretty good. Oh, it, and a banana, half a banana. And a banana. Okay. Well, that's, that sounds pretty good. Um, so. And some, uh, coffee. and some coffee, of course. And some coffee. Okay. So, sounds like you're eating your breakfast every day. Well, of huh? course I am. I have breakfast every single morning. Every I have a morning. bagel and half a banana and coffee every morning. Well, that's a great breakfast. I might start having that breakfast myself. It sure is. I'm going to time, time this out now. So what happens is Mary actually lives in town and Mary drops by. And what do you think she does not find in my kitchen? There's no peanut butter. There's no bagels. There's no bananas. And so what happened was when Mary asked me, when my daughter asked me, what did you have for breakfast? I answered her question 
with the automatic kind of piece. I answered her question with what I usually we had for breakfast when Mary was a little girl at home. And that was our breakfast we had every single morning. And so I'm not lying to her. I'm telling her what I think the answer is automatically. And so what happens with people early in dementia in this diamond state is you ask them, you try to monitor, you try to keep up, you call mom and you say, mom, do you need anything from the grocery store? And mom says, oh, I'm fine, I've got everything. And when you walk in the house, there's nothing. And it's really not that mom is trying to deceive you or that mom is trying to lie to you. It just truly is mom thinks she's got everything that she needs. She's not trying to deceive you or lie to you. That's just what she thinks. So what happens to people living with dementia at this state with nutrition and, and eating is they forget to shop. They forget to eat. And because it's part of what they've always done, they don't realize that that's really not happening. They also begin to have trouble in another part of their brain. Now, the motor parts of their brain the motor parts of the brain, they're being able to eat and to chew and do all those kinds of things. Those things are fine. They're having more trouble with this part of their brain early on. So this is where impulse control comes in. This is where organizing things comes in. So for people in this gym set, what you'll notice is, let's say, oh, I don't know. Does anybody on this call like ice cream? Show me thumbs up, put up your, your um, do your reaction if you've got it, if you like ice cream. Oh, lots of people like ice cream. So what happens is I have ice cream and I like ice cream. So I get some ice cream and I eat some ice cream and then I eat some more ice cream and then eat some more ice cream. Eat some more. So I might, the person living with dementia in this early state might be eating a lot, but not of the right kinds of things. So they're more likely to be drawn to things that are salty or sweet or fatty and, and not really keep up with the nutritional aspects, but it's more the pleasure seeking. Because what happens is I like it, I want it, I need it. If i am got that level of want and need. So they don't do a really good job of kind of keeping up with what they've had what they haven't had. So monitoring these kinds of changes becomes really important. Keeping up with what did they really have? What do they really need um, becomes something to keep up with. So they're not focused on a balanced diet. They're not focused on um, really nutrition. They're focused on the experience unless they're focused on you. The other thing that can happen for people at this gym state is they get so engaged and connected with the experience that I'm so enjoying spending time with my friend Lisa that we're talking and we're talking and we're talking and I don't actually get much nutrition because I'm not paying attention to the food and I'm really not eating. So that can be another challenge for people living with dementia at this stage. And lastly, the last kind of challenge we're gonna talk about that might be a problem for people at this, um, in this gym state, the last kind of thing that can happen is something that we probably should do a call on someday. And it's the overlap of depression and dementia. About 50% of people, between 30 to 50, my experience has been closer to 50%, of people living with dementia um, also will experience depression. And what happens with people with depression is often a change in appetite, either less appetite or more appetite. And it seems like just my noticing with people living with dementia, a lot of it tends to be less eating rather than more eating when that mood problem comes to be part of it. So what are we gonna do? It's not enough. This, this, this series is not about just identifying challenges. This series is really about solving problems. So how are you, going back to Mary, my daughter, how is Mary going to monitor what I'm eating, what's in my kitchen, 
without me thinking she's trying to take over because this is kind of the challenge in this time and this situation so let's say mary shows up at my house and she's got a bag of groceries now mary knows some things about my about her mom mary knows about her mom that she can't turn down a sale so when mary walks in with this big old bag of groceries and what do you think is going to be in the bag of groceries peanut butter and bagels and bananas mary's got to find a way so she doesn't hurt my feelings she doesn't embarrass me she doesn't distress me that i feel good about her coming on so mary give it a try hey mom sweetheart i'm so glad to see you i'm, I'm so glad to see you too hey look i brought you a surprise a surprise i did i did okay. i what, brought what, you what you used to fix this for us for breakfast when I was a little girl, and I always loved it. Look, I've got bagels, and I've got peanut butter, and you used to make this for me when I was a little girl. Well, we had it for breakfast every morning. We sure did. Yes, we did, and I thought of you when I saw them, and I brought them to you today so that we could have one. Well, I hope you didn't pay too much for them. I didn't. I didn't. They were on sale. Oh, because the last time I went to the store, you know how much they were charging for a bag of bagels? I don't know. How much? Four dollars. <gasps> That's highway robbery. It's ridiculous. I didn't even buy any. I'm, I, I'm sure you didn't, but I found these on sale and I know that you'll like them. I love you. I love you too, Mom. <laughs> All right. So, so that went really well. So now Mary has left enough bagels. If the bagels are there, if they're out on the cabinet where I see them, I'm very likely. And for those of you who don't know, my son is here and he's making himself a peanut butter bagel. He must have heard me from upstairs while he was on his Zoom call. No doubt. Um, so, so now they're bagels. Now they're bananas. Now there's peanut butter. If it's out on the cabinet, I see it. I'm much more likely to eat it. So one of the things we can do is find a way to help without really seeming like we're helping, without really acting like we're taking over or we're really helping. So some of the things can happen are really doing some monitoring. So the kind of monitoring you want to do are of things like what's going on in my kitchen. You know, is there really food in the kitchen, in the cabinets? You want to monitor. Please don't, for me, during COVID, monitor my weight. I'm doing not fine, but weight loss is not a problem for me during COVID. Um, but monitor how the person looks. Do their clothes seem to fit? Um, do they look about the same? Monitoring for that weight. Thinking about how do you impact the selection of nutrition? Because we can't just throw nutrition out with somebody who is at this gym state because we've got years to go for help. So we've got to have some healthy things in there. So planning for how do we kind of integrate some things that are nutritional and healthy with some things that also are fun and joyful. Thinking about things like spending time together to be social, spending time together for nutrition and keeping those together, but also distinct. Thinking about things like familiar kinds of restaurants and familiar kinds of meals. So what Mary did with that, you know, I'm bringing the peanut butter and the bagels because that's something I like, that's something I will eat. That's a real joy. And what doesn't help is, is trying to be my mother, trying to monitor me and to keep up with me, nagging, I'm worried about you. Those kinds of things really don't work for any human being, but especially not at this place in dementia. It really doesn't work. So some helpful things in there, some things to kind of hold on to, some interesting kind of things. So, all right. So good. So let's move on and let's talk about the next gem state. And the next gem state, the next thing we're going to, group of people we're going to talk about are people who are emeralds. And if you open your birthday present and you get an emerald this year for your birthday, oh, you're so excited. You're so excited because green 
on the stoplight stands for go. Gems are really brilliant and shiny and emeralds are really gorgeous and beautiful. And so emeralds are people who are still going and they're going into the past. They're going really busy, but they're having changes in those same parts of their brain. They're having changes in that hippocampus. They're having changes in that frontal lobe and they're starting to have trouble with more of the skill pieces. So they're having more trouble with things like putting things in order and sequencing things. So um, they're having difficulty with, with getting the steps through. So cooking is becoming a real problem. So most of these people are probably not going to be living alone. Most of these people are going to be living with somebody, having somebody near around and somebody around to help them. So what we're real, and I'll show you that slide of um, talking about the emeralds. I'll catch up with myself. So these emeralds from the GEMS model are people who are living in the past and time traveling. So they are struggling with not being able to really sit down and pay attention to what they're doing. So they're up moving around, they're walking around, they're having trouble kind of, of um, with all of the things that, all of the pieces, so they can get really, really, um, overwhelmed with all of the pieces that are going on. So if any of you, do y'all go to fancy restaurants every day? Do y'all go to fancy restaurants every week? No. Has anybody been to a fancy restaurant since like last Christmas or New Year's or something? Fancy restaurants. Not. So if you go to a fancy restaurant and you sit down and have you ever found extra things there that you're not used to? So show me thumbs up, nodding head, celebrate, yeah. So for people living with dementia in this emerald state, in my home, I have the utensil that I need and the thing that I need. So what often happens is when we start to put down the fork and the spoon and the knife and the cup, and then we've got things on the other side of the table that belong to somebody else and all of these other things around here Ooh, it starts to get a little bit overwhelming for that person living with dementia. So we're thinking about simplifying. What do we really need? What do we really have to have? Now, thinking about strat, so we're thinking about strategies. They did a study looking at nutrition and people living with dementia in this gem state, this level of dementia. And what they found was particularly for women, is if they sat down at the table and were expected to eat, they weren't very interested in eating. Now some of y'all are going, that doesn't make sense. So they changed one thing. The one thing they changed was they asked these women to help. They asked them to help. So what they did was they asked them to help make the salad or wipe off the tables. And what they noticed was people started eating because for this generation, rarely, and, and thinking about people in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, when, when with most, most people with dementia are in that age group, it's going to be different for people who might have dementia, who might be in their 60s or 50s or 40s, who might be more used to eating out, but for people in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, didn't do an awful lot of eating out, not being involved with food preparation, really didn't help them know what was going to happen next. So there's a process we're going to talk about for a minute called Next-ing, N-E-X-T-I-N-G, Next-ing. And it's the idea that if we do the first thing then what comes next will follow. So for these particular women, wiping off the table or fixing the meal became the trigger for the next thing, which was to sit down to eat. But without that first thing, the next thing wasn't very likely to happen. So when we think about making some changes in how we approach people living with dementia, 
this idea that we do what happens first, which might be preparing meal. It might be going to wash your hands. It might be watching the news and then we eat dinner. So we're thinking about what do we do first so that next piece will happen automatically. So thinking about the pieces, thinking about the structure and the system, thinking about how did people used to eat. So if I used to take my lunch to work every day in a brown bag, the best way to get me to eat lunch might be to what? Put it in a brown bag. If I'm used to having um, a meal at supper time and we're trying to make things simple, so supper is a sandwich, that might not feel like supper. That might feel more like lunch. Thinking about how do we make things fit in people who are thinking about the way time used to be. The next gym state we're gonna talk about are people who were in the amber state. So if you put your hands together, you open your birthday box, this year for your birthday, you get a beautiful piece of amber. And you go, that's not exactly a gem, and it isn't exactly a gem, but it's a stunning, unique, one of a kind piece of a moment. And so this insect is trapped in this resin in this moment. And so people in this gem state are living in this moment and they are getting all of the good they can get out of this moment. And what that means is they get very interested in things that they can experience. So they're very interested in their fingers and your fingers and they're very interested in exploring and sensory experiences. So what better thing to explore than food? So people at this gym site often get very interested in working with their food, manipulating their food, interacting and engaging in their food. And that is wonderful, except food doesn't count unless you get it in. So any food you don't get in doesn't really count. So we start to think about some things about the person. We thinking about what can they still do? Can they still use utensils? Or do we need to start thinking about supporting them and using their fingers? We start thinking about things about the environment. Do we need to give them one food at a time and one utensil at a time? Or do we need to overwhelm them with a lot of stuff? Do we wanna think about, one of the things we do with our brains is we filter all the things from the background. So if there's noise going on or conversation, I just ignore what I'm not really very interested in and I just focus on what I'm interested in. For people living with dementia, that background becomes so disruptive, they can't really focus on what it is they're trying to pay attention to. So thinking about the things that are going on in the environment. And also thinking about how can we kind of renew some of those processes of eating. So people in this gym state often do well with imitating what we do. So if I sit down with the person and I'm eating while they're eating, and I'm kind of matching my movement to their movement, they'll match their movement to my movement. If I want them to drink, if I pick up my drink and I point at it, then a lot of times that's all they need is that, that, that visual cue to copy what I'm doing. So that visual cue to see what I'm doing, to copy it and to really be part of it. The next gym state we're gonna talk about are rubies. So you get your box out, you open your birthday present. This year for your birthday present, what you get is a ruby. And this ruby is red and it's bright. And on the stoplight, it stands for stopping. So red on the stoplight stands for stopping. So we think about 
this is when some of those voluntary automatic kinds of pieces are really starting to slow down and really starting to stop. So this is when I'm providing more hands-on helping. I'm not just providing the, the things that I show the person, the things that I tell the person. This is when I'm actually providing some hands-on help. So take a deep breath. I'm going to show you my buddy here. So this is my buddy. So if any of you are interested in Pokemon, you'll recognize my Chimchar buddy here. And he needs some help eating. So this is a technique that Tifa modified from an occupational therapy approach called hand over hand. It didn't really work the way it was as helpful. And so she made some adaptations and developed um, a process called hand under hand. So I'm going to show you, we're not going to have a really good look at it because it's just a moment, but I shake hands with my person and get into an arm wrestling handshake. And then I use the tool the way I would usually use the tool. And I help my person eat. Now, if you're really interested in developing some real skill in these kinds of approaches, there are some ways to do that. Um, TIPA has champions courses that provide opportunity to really practice some of these things. Um, but, or, and there's some other resources online and things like that. But it's a way of helping without causing more problems. And what happens is the person actually begins to feel like they're the one who is doing it. So they will actually open their mouth and chew and swallow and get that nutrition in. So in this state, I'm starting to think about things because this is when people beginning kind of in that amber state, the motor part of eating is beginning to change a little bit. So in that amber state, people are going from grinding their food when they chew to actually chomping. So I'm starting to worry about things like meat and things like vegetables and replacing some protein sources with things like peanut butter and eggs and dairy. In this ruby state, we're actually getting to the point where the actual process of chewing and swallowing is becoming a challenge. So thinking about the textures of the food, do I do better with something that might be a milkshake or might be a softer food than something that requires a lot of chewing and those um, and eating kinds of things. So I'm thinking about that. I'm also thinking about at this point, I'm not so worried about, I'm still worried about nutrition, but I'm also really focusing on calories because as the person's ability to eat lowers, I have to make the calories more dense. So I'm thinking about adding things to food to give it more calories. So those milkshakes that I'm making, maybe, have, how many of y'all like peanut butter? I'm a big peanut butter fan. Any of y'all like peanut butter? Peanut butter is a great food. So I might be throwing some peanut butter in that, in that milkshake. Um, I might be throwing some peanut butter in with some yogurt and adding that extra calories, extra nutrition in that way. Trying to go through this pretty quickly so we'll have some time for some questions. Put your hands together. It's our last gem state. You open your box and this year for your birthday, you've got an oyster shell. And you kind of look at the person who gave you your birthday, your present, and you got to go, what? I thought I was good this year. Why are you giving me this stinking oyster shell? Because if you look at an oyster shell, it's not very pretty. It's kind of dry and it's kind of gray and it's really not very pretty. It's kind of ugly actually. And, mm, mm. but if I invest the time and the energy into that oyster shell, and I, I get it to open up a little bit. What I find in there is that spirit of that person and that pearl. So in this pearl state, people really aren't taking in 
food and nutrition for food and nutrition. It's more of kind of a sensory experience. It's more for the pleasure because our, our bodies are made in such a miraculous way that as we're losing that ability to chew and swallow, our bodies aren't absorbing anymore. And so we're not having that absorption. And so putting things in doesn't really matter as much from a nutritional perspective because it's not being absorbed. This is why one of the big conflicts of nutrition and eating for people living with dementia really shouldn't be a conflict as a, as a decision because the, for this, these particular conditions, these progressive kind of conditions, feeding tubes and, and nutrition and artificial nutrition, hydration, IVs and things like that really don't have much of an impact from a clinical perspective because it's an absorption issue and not an access issue. So it's not being absorbed. So it doesn't help people gain weight. It doesn't reduce people choking on the food because it still kind of comes back in people still chugs. It doesn't help with um, maintaining their skin or, or really with health kinds of things, but it truly is one of the ways that we can give people a joyful moment because if there's something you love, I, I had a lady who waited every year for the peach milkshakes to come out at Chick-fil-A. And that's what she loved. And they were only out for a short time and she loved the peach milkshakes. Well, her family went and bought peach milkshakes and gave her a taste of the peach milkshakes. Um, and she loved it. It was one of the, one positive way to connect with her when she was in her pearl stay. So we've kind of been through pretty quickly. I've kind of given some little strategies all along. I'm going to take a moment and pause. Like I said, I can talk forever. I'm going to take a moment and pause and ask people to put their questions um, in the chat. Um, if you want, if, if, can people raise their hands and ask the question if they need to, Lisa? People can raise their, raise their hand and ask a question. So let's take some time to really ask some questions and talk about your specific situations. So Mary Lee has a question. Yes, Mary Lee. Hi, Melanie. Um, I'm wondering with my mom, you were talking about sweets. So I can't, I can't hear you. Uh Oh, can, can you, you hear me is better? Is anybody else here? Sometimes my internet goes. Can you Walkie hear me better? I can't now? hear. How about now? I can hear you now. Thank you, Mary Lee. Sure. Hi, hey, Melanie. I think so, it's on the internet. <laughs> okay. My mom, just like you said, she loved sweets. And, um, you know, it seems like seniors have a tendency to gravitate towards the sweets anyway. Um, is it okay as long as they're not, you know, watching their blood sugar or something like that to add a little sweet to their breakfast to get them to eat? Well, I think I saw from your chat, you're doing that already for yourself, right? <laughs> well, that's a bad habit of mine. But what I would do with mom is I would drizzle a little um, maple syrup on her eggs or maybe a, a sausage that I'd cut up for her so that she'd get a little bit of that sweet as well as the protein. Yeah. And so anything that works, I'm going to, if it doesn't cause harm, if it works, I'm going to be fine with that. Um, maple syrup. I mean, that's kind of a new thing now is putting sweet on meat. I'm, I, it doesn't kind of, but, but a lot of people really like it. So it's, it's really a matter of choice. It's really a matter of taste. Um, I, what I, 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 what I worry about a little bit is indiscriminately dumping sugar on everything saying, oh, they like sweets, they'll eat it. That's right. kind of gross and disgusting. Um, but a little bit of maple syrup on stuff that people like that makes sense, absolutely. Um, one thing that happens with um, taste as people get older, this isn't a dementia thing, this is an aging thing, is people lose some of the taste of sweet and salty. And that seems the opposite of what Mary just said, that it's really not. 
what happens is when I don't get, when my, my taste buds don't distinguish sweet and salty as much, I need a more intense flavor to really be able to recognize it as sweet. So maybe if it's a pancake that's got maple syrup mixed in it, I don't get that sweet taste. But if it's a little bit of maple syrup on top of the pancake, I might really love that experience and get it. That's why you'll see a lot of older people with the salt shaker, just shaking and shaking and shaking. It doesn't taste right. A little sugar in the coffee, sugar in the coffee, sugar in the coffee. It doesn't have that same sweetness. So using things that have a different intensity of sweetness, like syrup, which is really a condensed um, sweet taste versus table um, sugar, which is a much less intense sweet taste actually will be really, really helpful. So good job. The other kinds of tastes that are preserved are things like sour and bitter. So that's why adding things like um, lemon to things can also kind of trigger some interest in food. So for example, someone might um, find a lemon um, icing on a, on a cake more than a chocolate or something. So using that lemon, putting lemon in tea or lemon on fish, you know, something that brings that kind of, of um, sour, the bitter of coffee, mixing coffee into lots of things can make it more appealing. Um, yeah, nice question, Mary. Lisa put something in the chat of what can I do for someone who is diamond or emerald, whose in, appetite is increased and eating a lot, independent can cook and the snack and eating more often now. So that's where it becomes a real challenge because we don't want to say no, no, no. But I start thinking about how can we have things that have that sweet taste or that salty taste or that savory taste that's really not so calorie dense. So maybe making sure um, Things like salads are around, but not just a salad, but a salad with a, a honey mustard um, or a balsamic vinaigrette or something that's really appealing. Um, so there's still something that's good, but it's not necessarily um, something that doesn't have some nutrition in it. Well, and again, I'm a real big milkshake people. If you've got a milkshake, you're getting protein, you're getting dairy, you're getting calcium, you're getting some fruit, you're getting some of those kinds of things um, to, 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 really, um, to really appeal. The other piece is sometimes what I've done is if people want to eat all the time, smoothies as well as milkshakes, yes. Um, if people really want to eat all the time, what I look at is how do we split that up through the day so we wind up with the final volume being right. So if I sit down and eat a meal and I get up and I'm still hungry, maybe you want the meal to only have 25% of the calories it would usually have. And now I've got the rest of that that I can spread out through the day. So maybe thinking about volume and thinking about how do we spread that out across the day instead of having um, the meal and this wanting to eat all day long or, or feeling. That comes from that frontal lobe. And it also comes from um, part of the brain that says, it's okay, I'm satisfied. You know, that I, I feel satisfied. That part of the brain doesn't really connect as well in people living with dementia. So they eat, but they don't have that sense of being, okay, I'm satisfied now. So there's that craving for more and more and more and more. The other piece that can be part of that is what else do they have to do? So if I'm at home and I mean, how many of you have found if you're, you're staying at home more that you're spending more time in your kitchen? Has that been something somebody's noticed? So the kitchen's right there. You, it's not like I'm at work with nasty stuff. I'm in at my home, I've got stuff I like, so or even stuff I don't like, the kitchen is there. I do my Zoom calls from my kitchen. I'm staring at my freezer all day long. I live with a 19 year old son. I have to have stuff in the refrigerator. Um, you know, I have to. So I'm sitting here staring at the refrigerator all day long. So thinking about what can we do to kind of help things happen outside of the kitchen? What can we do to help the person spend more time 
in different rooms or spend more time doing other things. So maybe what I do is I take over a box of bulletins from the church and I say, mom, um, could you help me? These need to be folded by Sunday. So now mom is spending a couple of hours folding bulletins for church and she's not in the kitchen and she's doing something with her hands and she's feeling good about herself. She's being productive. She's feeling like she's accomplishing something. So it's working for her in a variety of different ways. Thinking about that person, thinking about environment, thinking about our approaches. What doesn't work is logic and reason. The third time we bought you new pants since COVID started. Um, looking back in the chat, um, um, and, and uh, yes, milkshakes with Ensure or other protein drink. Um, the other thing you can do is add things like those instant breakfast. Um, you can add those and they've got, often got a lot of nutrition in them. So those are some good suggestions. Um, from Linda, a feeding tube um, was more for us to feel like we we're doing, you know, and, and people do the best they can. People truly do, and people make the best decisions they can make based on the information they've got in this moment. So regretting something isn't really um, learning from it, yes, but regretting it, you did the best you can. Um, people get a lot of pressure from healthcare providers um, to do these interventions, and People are told, um, and you know, you need to do this so your mother does, you know, we can't meet, your mother needs this. Um, so there's a lot of pressure to follow that advice. There also are some times when it makes sense. Um, I've used feeding tubes in people living with dementia, um, short-term recovering from things. Or when we, we're seeing, we don't know if this is really the end of dementia or if this is something else going on. So we do something to see what the outcome is going to be. We, we have, as, as a culture, have such a strong connection with food as how we take care of people. And, and it comes from infants relying on us for their basic needs and, and we feed them. And then it, it's our social things are around, you know, I, I'm not gonna say to Mary Lee, um, do you wanna meet me and go for a walk? I probably should. I'm gonna say, do you wanna meet me for a coffee and, and a bagel? You know, so we, we probably should get into doing more of those kinds of, of movement activity kinds of things instead of, but right now our culture is, we spend our time together over the table or around the table. So this idea that taking care of somebody is providing nutrition is a strong value. And so you do the best you can with what you've got. And, and for some people, it, um, it's a decision that that person would have made if they had been able to speak out. I, I had a guy I worked with who said, if you don't do everything, I'm gonna come back and haunt you. And I believed him, you know, and so I did everything because that was really his expressed wish. That was really what he wanted. So we do the best we can. We make the best decisions. We learn from it, we go on. So looking back and so no, I don't think it was the wrong thing to do. I think when we offer people choices, you know, we offer yes, we offer no, we've got to um, respect whatever choice that family comes to. Um, and let's see, someone else is talking about insure and spinach and other good stuff and peanut butter powder is another good choice to add. People who are allergic to peanut butter, there are all kinds of protein butters out there now that can be really, really helpful. So other questions or things that people are curious about, you can put your hand up or you can put in the chat or you can just ask. Otherwise, I'll just keep talking.
So that was really about 15 seconds. Time on Zoom feels so incredibly long and confusing. Yes, I see Catherine, Catherine Stone waving at me. I think Hi I there. recognize y'all. Um, the question we have, um, dad lives with me and Ellen, my sister Ellen's here and she's here every day. And um, he will, he's now started doing the thing where one day he loves something and then we have it the second time and it's like, I hate this or I don't want this. Is that just normal? Yeah, that really happens. That really does happen. Um, and it's, it's, I don't know why it happens. I think it could be anything from um, some days I'm in the mood for something and some days I'm not to an emotional memory that might be triggered. So maybe it's something I, it, one day it reminds me of something, the other day it reminds me of something else. The other thing is a lot of times um, for people, for older people in general, but people living with dementia specifically, um, have you ever had something and it just wasn't what you expected? So someone gave, and I'm going to move around because the sun is following me around my kitchen. So I'm going to move around a little bit, get where not quite so much in that strange light. Um, someone handed me an Oreo one day and I like Oreos. And so I ate the Oreo and the Oreo was just awful. And I've never in my life had an awful Oreo. But what I figured out, what do you think was wrong with my Oreo? Somebody can put it in the chat or can respond. What do you think was wrong with my Oreo? Somebody said stale, stale. No, even stale Oreos are good. It was, it was a low fat Oreo. And so the, it wasn't the taste, it was the texture. The texture of the filling just wasn't right. And it just wasn't what I remember the experience. So it might be your dad one day sees the meal that you've shared with them or the sandwich that you shared or the item that you've shared. And he remembers it as being really, really wonderful. But then when he eats it, it's a low fat Oreo. And so then the next time you offer him his, his emotional memory is not, oh, that was so wonderful. I love that food. It's more like that's disappointing. Who wants a low fat Oreo? So I wonder if it could be something like that. It could just be something about the mood that he's in. So, you know, don't go to Sam's or Costco's because he ate something one time and buy, you know, the, the 20 pound bag of whatever it is. Um, but give, get, but, but wait a while and go back and try it again. Is that helpful, Catherine? And your sister, and I forgot your sister's name already. Ellen. Ellen. Betsy, Betsy's friend, Ellen. Betsy. Oh, Betsy's friend. I know you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's so funny when you see people where you're not expecting them, it confuses and throws me a little bit. I understand. Yeah, thank you. It's good to see you, Betsy. Thank great. you. It's like old home week. We've got Lisa Gwyther. I mean, it's just so much fun to see everybody out there. Um, so uh, something else is the ability to chew loss before the ability to swallow. And yes, so the ability to chew, chewing actually is, and we don't think about it this way. We think about chewing as being a gross motor, just kind of a chomping. Chewing is actually a fine motor skill. So chewing actually involves a lot of manipulation and a lot of grinding. So chewing begins to become a problem you know, really pretty early in the disease. And what happens is you'll see people will eat meat. I used to see this uh, back my very first job working in the hospital back in 1983. Um, people would get their plates and they would put their, their meat in their mouth and they chew and they chew and they chew. And they chew 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 and then they spit it back out on their tray. And the family would go, I don't know what's wrong. She usually likes meatloaf. And the, the meatloaf came on, a, on a, a, um, a soft diet. Meatloaf is considered a softish, mechanical, soft food. But the texture of the protein tells your brain 
it's not okay. The texture of the protein tells your brain, you need to grind this, you aren't grinding this, so you try as hard as you can, but all you can do is chomp, so you chomp and you chomp and you chomp, and then it's not that you can't mechanically swallow, it's your brain tells your muscles it's dangerous to swallow this. This is not safe to swallow, so you spit it out. So that's why proteins that are smooth, so things like peanut butter um, and, and things like eggs, things that don't have that texture. Because even if you grind meat, you've got like um, ground beef or ground turkey, it still has the protein in it that your brain recognizes and says, that's not good enough. You haven't chewed that up well enough. You shouldn't be swallowing that. So that is when um, the ability to chew starts to, swallowing really happens more in that ruby pearl state. So there are lots of things that we can do to help with swallowing. And some of the things we can do to help with swallowing is, so um, put your chin up like this. Everybody do this, put your chin up. And now take three deep breaths and try to swallow with your chin up. And there are a couple of things that are wrong about that. Was that hard, easy or hard? It was really hard. There are a couple of things that are hard about that. One thing is, it's really hard to swallow when your mouth is dry. And so one of the recommendations I make about giving people medications and about eating is to make sure people moisten their mouth before they start eating. So I have people, when I give people, when I was working as a staff nurse, I did this. I didn't know why I did this, but I knew it worked. And that was back in 1985. Um, give people a sip and then give them their medicine. And then they can swallow it. Give people some water to drink before they, I mean, not like, you know, a 20 ounce. I mean, we, we serving sizes are just out of control. So not like a 20 ounce, but a small, you know, a small sip to eat. The, and I know, oh, the time is gone, but just real quick. So thinking about making sure people's chins are down when they start to swallow and eat. So we're not helping standing up over people, making sure people's chins are down. The other thing that can be helpful is temperature. Because foods that have temperature that, to them, are trigger some of that um, that reflexive kind of bolusing the food so we can swallow it. So I'm not talking really hot, really freezing, but a lot of times when we get when people are having trouble chewing and swallowing, and we move to foods that are soft, a lot of soft food is really room temperature, so it doesn't give them that extra sensory experience. Of, of what they need to swallow. So food that's cool or food that's warm. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Lisa because I ran out of time, I'm so sorry. If you need some more information, if you wanna reach out, reach out to Dementia Alliance of North Carolina. Please do, if you have more questions for Melanie about this, if you get offline and you think, oh, why didn't I ask that? Please send those to me. Um, in the link to this webinar, you have my email address, so you can just reply back to that. Please know that after this, you will receive an email with a survey attached, and we ask that you give us your feedback on this. You can ask questions there if you'd like. And then if you haven't registered for our next one of these sessions, um, it is going to be October 16th. Um, that's a Friday and you will if you have registered you will receive the link for that the evening before Melanie we can't thank you enough for this it was so interesting today and we really appreciate your time and thank you everyone and we hope you have a wonderful day